the molecular mechanisms of human virus surface antigens and antiviral antibodies using a diverse toolkit of structural and biochemical techniques. She uses her discoveries to design novel vaccines and antiviral therapeutics. Uh, before joining UCSC, she was a postdoc at the Pasteur Institute in Paris and at the St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. She received her PhD in biochemistry at UC San Diego and her bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado Boulder. And today she's going to talk to us about vaccines and viruses. so much. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here today and get to speak with you all. Okay, again, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Um, I have now, it's been almost 10 years since I interviewed here, um, and I have been uh, situated in the Baskin Engineering Building since I got here, and I just, I love it here, and um, sometimes on really busy weeks like this week, I am really looking forward to being part of your group. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> so um, I would love to start by reminding everyone that pre-pandemic, there were still lots of viruses in the news. Um, you remember the Ebola outbreak? Zika virus, new strains of viruses being discovered, things about vaccines too, how well the flu vaccine works, the new shingles vaccine, everybody get it? And there was even hints from some uh, people saying, watch out, the next pandemic is probably gonna be respiratory-based virus. <laughs> so uh, sure enough, that's what we've had for the, the past three years here. But um, I will just say that there's a lot of new viruses in the news. You've probably heard about monkeypox. There was another outbreak of Ebola, um, some other scarier viruses emerging in new places. And you might've heard of the triple demic, um, which is RSV, flu, and COVID all kind of peaking at one time. Um, I will be talking about RSV. That's something that my lab studies. So, but we do, we live in a world of viruses. They can be uh, scary, but also in my mind as a scientist, fascinating. And I'm always interested in just how they have evolved to be able to do what they do. So I love this definition of a virus. It's a simply a bad piece of news wrapped in protein. <laughs> so that bad piece of news, of course, is the viral genome and the protein are uh, the molecules on the outside of the virus that allow it to attach to and infect a host cell. Those proteins are also the target of our immune system. So uh, my interests in my lab are really to understand that molecular warfare happening between the virus and the host. So as I said, the proteins on the surface, they really act like little keys to infect our cells and they have evolved to attach to certain factors. And those keys really have evolved to be a perfect match for certain cells and things on the surface of cells. But these are also the target of our immune system. And so these, I also will call these virus surface proteins antigens. That's short for antibody generator. And I'll talk about antibodies a bit today. So the first thing that I think everyone has been educated on in the past couple years, how does our immune system respond to a virus infection? We have really a sort of short-term house alarm, non-specific kind of response, but we have what's called an adaptive immune system where we really, our immune system learns exactly what that infectious disease is 
and develops immunity against that specific thing. Um, and that is uh, a big part of that is a type of what white blood cell called B cells. And B cells are antibody producing cells. So antibodies are uh, initially on a membrane bound form on the surface of the cell. And when they have a sequence that makes a surface that is just a perfect lock and key for a virus antigen, it sticks and it activates that B cell. And that B cell starts producing a lot of antibodies. Those antibodies are in our blood serum. They're floating around, they're in all of our tissues and they're ready to attack. And when they attack, really what they do is stick. They stick like glue and they just block that virus from being able to stick to our own cells. They, they just hysterically block those sites and prevent the virus from being infectious anymore. There are also parts of the antibody that when they're, when they're stuck to a virus, we have other cells that recognize this kind of form and will take it up and de degrade it and get rid of it. So vaccines are a way to safely stimulate antibody production. Natural infection, of course, goes through an infected and an infectious stage. And this is not ideal to go through that. But um, assuming you can recover, um, you will have antibodies that recognize that and protect you from future infections. But vaccines are meant to look exactly like the virus. And that's a big part of what I'll be talking about. Look, what is, does it really look like the virus? Expose your immune system with no infected or infectious stage and you get those antibodies. Uh, a, a brief history of vaccines. Uh, you might think they're a more modern uh, advancement in human health, but really uh, back in the 1700s, a doctor had heard claims that local dairy maids that were exposed to cowpox made them immune to smallpox. Um, he tested his theory in what I will say is a very unethical way, but his theory was confirmed and cowpox did protect against smallpox. Um, as you heard, I studied at the Pasteur Institute. So Louis Pasteur, uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, performed really uh, an essential experiment um, hypothesizing. Again, this was before we could had any ways to visualize uh, viruses and things, but he hypothesized that exposure to an inactivated form would elicit protection. So he took dried, crushed spinal cords from dogs that had died from rabies and injected them into healthy dogs and exposed those dogs to rabies and they survived. And in a very dramatic uh, situation, a nine-year-old boy that was had been bitten by a rabid dog was brought to pasture. And that at the time, that was essentially a death sentence for that boy. Uh, Pasteur gave him an, an injection of the dried, crushed spinal cords, and that boy survived. Uh, in the mid-1900s, Jonas Salk developed poliovirus vaccine. Um, the virus was, he was able to grow it in the lab in a cell culture and inactivate it. So I love this. Um, this is just really a snapshot of different diseases. And I wanna highlight mumps and rubella and measles. Those are all respiratory viruses. And the size of this, and then it's a timeline here from 1945 to now. And the size of the circle was the number of reported cases at that time. And as you know, measles is highly infectious. And you can see as soon as the vaccine was developed as designated by the orange spot, cases just dropped rapidly. Measles, we just, it's beautiful. The vaccines are amazing. Measles. And of course, this little blip here is that outbreak that happened at Disneyland a few years ago, if you remember that. And there have been outbreaks in the last year too, um, mainly in unvaccinated uh, people. Is this yours? But you can see as uh, soon as those vaccines are developed- more ice is mine. Dropping cases. Less ice, I mean. <laughs> it tastes funny. Pre-COVID, we had uh, several different kinds of vaccines. Uh, I've mentioned inactivated or live attenuated viruses. 
um, inactivated like our flu shots are um, mostly inactivated. We have live attenuated like our measles, mumps, and rubella uh, vaccine. MMRV now, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella. So um, that prevents uh, chickenpox. There's now what you hear, protein-based vaccines, recombinant protein, and a recombinant just means it's made in a lab, and viral vector, where another harmless virus will carry the genetic information to your cells to make that vaccine antigen protein. And as you know, uh, really due to the COVID pandemic, <laughs> we tried out mRNA vaccines that had been developed but never fully implemented in clinical trials, and they have been working beautifully. mRNA, also called messenger RNA, is the information for our cells to produce that protein. We also have, um, at least in our country, recombinant protein vaccines for coronavirus, and in other countries, there's inactivated virus. But no matter the vaccine platform, they are all meant to do exactly the same thing, is to get our bodies to generate uh, protective antibodies that will protect us from infection and disease. So what I'd like to talk about is um, the thought process uh, right now of what my lab does to go from the sequence of a virus. So how do we go from you know, this brand new virus has emerged in humans. Here's the sequence. This is just 10% of the coronavirus sequence, by the way. Um, how do we go from that to a vaccine? And so my lab does something called structure-based vaccine design, where we really think about what the structure of the proteins on the surface of the virus look like and where the antibodies target. These are the viruses that my lab currently studies. Um, the top two, as you know, are respiratory viruses, astrovirus and norovirus are gastrointestinal. And a big part of uh, focus of my research is on uh, viruses that really have no vaccines or don't have ideal vaccines, um, and especially ones that cause infections in children. Respiratory syncytial virus is a top cause of severe lower respiratory tract infections in children, especially infants. And pretty much everyone is infected by the age of two. And worldwide, RSV is really only second to malaria in causing childhood deaths due to infectious disease. In the USA, uh, really thousands of hospitalizations and deaths are in older adults due to RSV. And at the current moment, we have no post-infection antiviral treatments and no licensed vaccine. So this is a major unmet need. Here's a electron micrograph of the virus. You can just see it's um, kind of similar in Conceptually, like coronavirus, it's got a lipid membrane and on the surface is um, sort of fuzzy, little fuzz, and those are the antigens, the proteins on the surface. Um, unlike coronavirus, which has one, the spike protein, RSV has two. The G, the attachment protein that attaches to the host cell receptor, and F, the fusion protein. The fusion protein fuses the virus and host membranes, and that allows the genetic information to get inside our cells. So the virus really needs these two coordinated proteins in order to cause infection. Uh, RSV has been haunted in its vaccine development efforts. Um, in the 1960s, there was a clinical trial in children and an inactivated RSV vaccine was made, very similar to how other inactivated vaccines are made. There was no obvious uh, concern about it. However, the children that received the vaccine 
all uh, experienced enhanced disease symptoms once they were naturally infected with RSV. So not only did the vaccine not protect them, but they got worse disease once they were naturally infected. So what went wrong? What was wrong with this vaccine? I, I will say there were uh, preclinical studies in animals that did not support this, uh, this um, observation. What we know now is that the F protein, the fusion protein, has two forms. The pre-infection form that's found on the surface of the virus. And once it fuses with the host cell, the membrane, it gets the membranes to fuse together. It converts to what's called a post-infection or post-fusion form. And it turns out the inactivated vaccine, the inactivation pr procedure caused this protein that was on the surface of the live virus to flip to this form. So the vaccine was made with this form. The people developed antibodies to that form, but unfortunately those antibodies did not recognize the virus. They recognized the the wrong form of it. So they didn't block virus infection. And there are some other thoughts about how these antibodies could have led to enhanced disease. So I've mentioned the F protein, but there's another protein on the surface of the virus. What happened with that protein during the inactivation procedure? We have no idea because when I started this study, um, nothing really was known about the G protein. Um, it, it was known that it attaches to a human cell receptor, but not much is known about the structure or anything about how antibodies interact with it to provide protection. So my lab has asked the question, what does the RSVG protein look like? How and where do antibodies stick to this protein? And can we use that information to develop a vaccine? And I'll give a shout out to some of the key players in my lab. Um, I just, uh, it's, uh, as you all know, um, it's really the, one of the best parts of my job is mentoring and getting to help these students uh, come into their own and be independent. And so uh, it's great to get to talk about their uh, findings and work. This is in collaboration with Trellis Bioscience, a biotech company and the University of Georgia. So the first thing we wanted to do is make the RSVG protein in the lab. My lab doesn't have any infectious uh, viruses in it, so you're welcome to visit. Uh, by the way, I would love to give lab tours to anyone that's interested. Um, what we do is synthesize uh, DNA, the gene uh, that encodes RSVG. We insert that into lab cultured cells and the cells are acting like little machines to um, make the protein for us and we can purify and isolate it. We are also studying human antibodies that are known to target RSVG. And th these were discovered by that biotech company I mentioned. What they did was went to pediatric nurses, drew their blood and looked for B cells making antibodies that target RSV with the assumption that pediatric nurses are constantly exposed to children with RSV and must have really good immunity. So what did their, what antibodies did those people make? So once my lab gets uh, purified G and human antibodies, we stick them together, we see how they interact, and we want to look at that structurally at the molecular level. And um, my lab uses a technique called X-ray crystallography to do that. First, we have to get our protein samples to, we have to coax them to form crystals. These are pretty small sub uh, millimeter size crystals. And um, this is definitely sort of a bottleneck in my field. Sometimes it's just luck, but really the concept is the same as the old uh, sugar crystallization experiment that we did in, in, as kids. Once we get these crystals, um, we scoop them up and shoot them with x-ray beams. And those x-rays diffract off the electrons in our proteins. I use the advanced light source, um, a circular particle accelerator in Berkeley um, that provides really strong x-ray beams. 
But in reality, I ship, I FedEx my samples there and I get to sit on a computer here and collect data. Um, and so we collect this diffraction pattern and that information allows us to back calculate um, and give us the information on the structure of the protein that was in that crystal. And what we get is this data shown in the blue mesh here. And if you know, so proteins are linear strings of amino acids that fold into three dimensions. And so I'll just kind of point out that this is sort of the, the backbone, the linear string of part of a protein here. And these are the side chains, the different amino acids that stick off of that. But really these sequences have evolved to form a three-dimensional fold, and that is essential for its function. In this case, for the virus to infect our cells or antibodies to bind and block. It really comes down to these, uh, these surfaces. But at this point, it's a really fun part of our job is we get to essentially do a 3D jigsaw puzzle. We fit in the amino acids to the data. And this was one of the first structures we solved. Um, in gray is part of a human antibody and in cyan is part of the RSVG protein. Um, I say fragment. What was known about this antibody is that it binds this little fragment of the G protein. But if uh, what we know about antibodies is this kind of blobby section right here. It's a little bit hard to see, but um, those are parts of antibodies that evolve to get better and better at sticking to its antigen target. And so we observed in the structure that it's not sticking to anything. And we hypothesized that this antibody actually binds a bigger fragment that wasn't recognized as important. And sure enough, we took a bigger piece of the G protein antigen and solved the structure. And you could see that this fragment kind of wraps around in a loop and comes over this way. So the antibody is binding this three-dimensional surface and complex fold on the G. And so here's just a little G again is in cyan and the antibody kind of sticks and wraps around that section. So since this first structure, we have solved three more structures and another lab has published two structures. And if you look at that, this is again the G here and every single different color is a different antibody. And you can see that our immune system just attacks from every angle it can see. It, it, um, it recognizes a surface and it attacks. And so really this, this is what our immune system looks like when we receive a vaccination or we're infected. We generate a lot of different antibodies that attack from all sorts of different angles. Okay. In addition to solving those structures, we do a number of binding assays. We have really quantitative ways to measure the strength of interaction between the antibodies and their target. And we also develop sort of cellular-based assays and things to see if the antibodies are blocking the function of the virus protein. For example, in this one, um, RSVG is in the bottom of a uh, a cell culture plate and human cells are in the top, a certain kind of human cells and human cells naturally migrate towards that virus protein. That's part of its activity. And then we can test, uh, so we can measure that migratory activity and then we can see if antibodies block that migratory activity. So what I'm hoping you are taking home is that vaccine antigens uh, should really look like the virus at that atomic three-dimensional level. Because we want vaccines to stimulate antibodies that stick really tightly. If we made a vaccine of just that little fragment, remember the first structure, we wouldn't get the antibody that's evolved and binds really tightly to that bigger part of the virus. So we really need the whole part of the virus and uh, the part uh, that and folded in the correct way. <clears throat> so this is the kind of information that we use to design vaccine candidates, 
And so in the case of RSVG, that part that I showed you in Cyan, that was uh, about a quarter of the whole RSVG protein. So what we've learned is antibodies really preferentially target that spot. I will say that we selected for antibodies that bind multiple strains of the virus. We wanted those antibodies that are really cross-reactive. So, um, but what, it, what it's telling us is we need a vaccine that focuses the immune response to that part. And so we developed uh, some vaccine candidates and sent them to our collaborators in Georgia um, to perform some preclinical studies in mice. And this is just one um, figure from the paper, but mice that were vaccinated. So we, we generated some previous vaccine candidates that had been published in the literature and compared them to our vaccine candidate that really uh, focuses and enhances the immune response. And this is the antibody levels shown here. And so each spot is a different mouse. So really all the mice generated very strong antibody responses towards that gene. Um, I will also note there were no safety concerns. Um, since that terrible clinical trial in the 60s, um, scientists have been able to recapitulate that enhanced disease phenomena in mice, and we know how to test for that now. So you may have heard about RSV vaccine development in the news. Uh, the, the great news, <laughs> <laughs> Although it's not my favorite antigen, but um, the great news is that vaccines, efficacious vaccines, are coming very soon. Uh, Pfizer, GSK, and Moderna have all released phase three clinical trial data with the RSVF protein, either protein or mRNA vaccines. These phase three clinical trials were with tens of thousands of people. So these are really big trials, just like they did um, for the COVID vaccines. And there's 80 to all of them are around 80 to 85 percent efficacy against severe disease. As I mentioned, RSV is a problem in older adults. So this these clinical trials were in older adults. But uh, Pfizer's vaccine was also tested in pregnant women. So are pregnant women um, getting RSV really bad? No, but if you vaccinate a pregnant woman, her antibodies get transferred through the placenta to the baby and also through the breast milk. And so by vaccinating pregnant women, that provides immediate protection for their infants. Uh, at least in the first three months, um, it wanes over time, but at least in the first three months, which really is a critical period of time for infants getting RSV. There's also a um, long acting monoclonal antibody. So this is a, a, an antibody made in the lab and injected um, and tested in newborns. That's called almost artificial immunity. They didn't make that those antibodies themselves, they got an injection of antibody, but this has, and has been found to be 75% effic efficacious against severe disease in newborns. So all of these are being reviewed by the FDA, and I think at least uh, more than one will be FDA approved. So I strongly encourage you to get the RSV vaccines um, as soon as they're available. So despite um, the, su the apparent success of these and um, likely approval, you can see that none of these vaccines uh, target the RSVG antigen that I told you about. Everything is focused on the F. And so um, all of these clinical trials have the, set the bar at preventing severe disease. As we know with COVID, that still is like the most important thing is to prevent hospitalization and severe disease. But these vaccines are really not that great at, pre at preventing infection or mild to moderate disease. This is still a big problem in infants and children when their parents are staying home and they're missing out on school and things. Um, so I think there's room for improvement. Um, we really need to also think about the likelihood that RSV um, is going to acquire mutations once there's more um, immunity in the population. And 
eventually the virus could start to evade our, evade our approved vaccines. None of these uh, vaccines were tested in young children. Again, it was in pregnant women transferring antibodies to the newborn infants. And then also the monoclonal antibody was a newborn infant um, thing. So, um, and what I didn't talk about much is that we really need post-infection therapies. There is nothing. There's, when babies come into the hospital, they get, um, you know, oxygen, respiratory help, and maybe um, sort of like a steroid vapor to kind of help open up their airways, but there's nothing um, that's targeted to really reduce RSV replication. So I do think RSVG targeting vaccines and antibodies could fill this gap. If we add RSVG antigen to the vaccines, I think you would see less infection overall, less mild and moderate disease and reduced virus spread. I think having an additional antigen would just make it that much harder for the virus to overcome immunity. We would have more diverse antibodies and the virus would need to mutate more to evade them. And we do have some preclinical studies in uh, mouse models suggesting that a monoclonal antibody therapy used as a treatment um, it could be effective. So with that, I will thank you guys. Um, we really have a lot of fun in the lab. Um, everybody's doing kind of the same kind of experiments, but maybe have their own virus that they're fo focusing on. Um, we have undergrads, graduate students, postdocs, um, everything. And so as you can see, yeah, we have a lot of fun. Um, we really benefit from support from UC Santa Cruz, from the NIH funding, as well as fellowships for some of our students. And so thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Can you repeat the questions so that... Yes, great idea. I will repeat questions. So, um... Questions? Yeah. yeah, two questions. Um, you talked about the, the white B blood cells mm -hmm. uh, is acquiring it. How does it do it? Have there been studies on that? And on the second thing, um, you mentioned what you needed for older adults. Do older adults lose their immunity, assuming they're immune when they were young, later on in life? Yes. Great questions. Um, here I am back to here. Um, so the first question was, how do these B cells work? Um, the amazing thing about our genome is the are the antibody genes. Those are constantly mutating mm -hmm. and changing, specifically in our B cells. So whereas you might say, here on on our UCSD campus, we have solved the human genome. That is all the human genome and just maybe a starting point for antibody, but really each of our bodies are producing millions of different sequences of antibodies. And there's this really amazing genetic rearrangement of our antibody genes and mutations, and that helps antibodies evolve. But ultimately those genes encode a protein sequence, and it really is just trial and error. B cells that make antibodies that don't stick to anything eventually slow down and die. But B cells, when they happen to make an antibody that sticks to a target, they amplify and they have a signaling pathway that says, make lots of secreted antibodies, send them out, we're being infected. We need to remember this for the future. And they eventually turn into memory B cells that can be lifelong. And um, that does lead to your next question. Why are older people getting RSV infection? Weren't they infected as kids? Um, we are all infected with RSV um, throughout life, actually. RSV is one of those things where we have temporary antibody immunity and it just wanes over time. And we could be reinfected with the same strain every five or 10 years. And so um, it's, I think there are some sneaky things that the virus is doing to prevent our memory B cells from really becoming established. Um, but in general, 
infections become more mild as you become an adult. And once you're older, the immune system starts to wane really for everything. Um, and so I had, sorry, I didn't mean to say that right, but many different things, which is why we have high dose um, flu vaccines and things. We just need a little bit more to get that immune system back up to the level of a protective threshold. <laughs> That was super clear you know, for somebody with no back of an immune theory. So thank you for that. I'm wondering, since you're working on RSVG, and it sounds like it would get added into existing almost ready vaccines. Technically, what does that mean? Is it like add RSVG and <laughs> Are there problems that get generated when you try to combine two things like that? Yes. Um, so the question is, if we come up with a successful RSVG vaccine antigen, how would that get incorporated? Um, as I mentioned, the, the current vaccines are focused on the RSVF protein, are in the form of mRNA, encoding the F protein, or pure F protein purified in the lab. So what we are testing actually is pure RSVG protein. So what we would test, if we find a successful candidate, which I think we're on the right track, we would mix it in with the F protein and test that as a combined vaccine preclinically. Um, or the G protein could be encoded in mRNA and again mixed. Just like our bivalent COVID vaccines, they went from a single RNA sequence to two different mRNA sequences, encoding the original and the Omicron variant. And so we just can mix them together, as you said. Very. So a question from one of the people watching on Zoom, are there other viruses that have two different surface molecules like equivalent to the F and G and have they been successfully uh, treated with, with uh, vaccines? Yes, have there, are there other viruses with two proteins on the surface and how have they been, how have vaccines have been developed? Um, the measles, mumps, rubella, um, those three are very similar to RSV in a close related virus family. And so they have two proteins. Um, though va those vaccines are live attenuated. So they have the two together. Um, our flu influenza has two proteins, uh, an attachment and a fusion protein, just like RSV. But our, our vaccines are the isolated, um, uh, actually, sorry, uh, that's not true. They, they have two proteins, um, but the one we focus on is the HA that had the hemagglutinin protein that has the attachment and fusion activities in it. Um, so, but I actually, part of my influenza research is asking whether the addition of the other protein could be useful. That other protein actually helps the virus to release from cells and spread. So theoretically, if we had antibodies against it, we could reduce the spread within our bodies as well as reduce transmission to others. So that's something that we're looking at. And I think it's um, maybe starting to be realized more that multiple antigens will provide broader protection um, against the evolution of viruses. How do, you, how do you look for uh, unintended consequences of the vaccine attacking the natural part of the body. Is that, do mm -hmm. you have to wait until clinical trials or <laughs> are there some standard rules of things that one shouldn't do? How, how does that happen? Um, our, so how do, how do we prevent vaccines from stimulating antibodies that attack self? That would essentially induce autoimmunity, immunity against self, which is not good. Um, thankfully, our, um, our immune system has a way to reject the proliferation of B cells that recognize self. So we have this system in our lymph nodes and our spleen where a big part of the antibody production is happening. And so when those things recognize self, I don't know exactly how it happens, but when they recognize self, those cells get destroyed. So sometimes actually when, you know, 
Despite me saying that antibodies attack the surface from every single level, often what we see are patches where antibodies never bind. And we think that maybe that one surface looks like self and our bodies are naturally like making sure that those antibodies don't get produced because it might look like self. Mm -hmm. so if you're successful, this could be, since we are all infected, quite lucrative. How do you work out intellectual property between yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, thankfully, we have an excellent intellectual property um, office uh, here at UCSC. Um, and so they are, they're really, they're, they're quite frank and um, protective of UCSC intellectual property. Um, something that I guess I would say in, in my past is, you know, maybe a grad student was like, I'm going to develop a vaccine and make it free to everyone and, you know, no patent and anything. But um, the reality is that it needs to have patent protection in order for a biotech company to pick that up and put in the investment for clinical trials. When you put thousands of people through clinical trials, that's a lot of office visits, blood samples drawn, follow-up clinics and things. And so um, that's an essential part. Um, so our intellectual property office mm -hmm. says, let me know when you have something before you speak about it and before you publish it so that we can um, secure that idea and make it possible for it to be brought forward. <laughs> I noticed one of your news that talked about shingles. Can you say something about this? My memory was that that was a, came from the chicken pot when you were young. And it yes. Hit somewhere in our nerves and then just revealed and become shingles. So mm -hmm. now she's vaccine, but we already have. The one who gets chick pox. Can you say something more about it? Then? Yes. So, uh, yes. So um, shingles is caused by a reactivated uh, varicella zoster virus um, or chicken pox virus. Um, so we, including myself, uh, were all infected with chicken pox as kids. And I just think it's incredible that my children will not get chicken pox because they got the vaccine. Um, we were infected. We generated an antibody response. But this virus is a DNA virus, and it tracks along nerves and becomes latent. Um, it's actually related to herpes viruses. I don't know if anyone gets cold sores. I do, but it's, that's also a herpes virus that becomes latent and can be reactivated to cause new infections uh, under stress or when your immune system stops suppressing it. And so when you get older and that immunity starts to wane, that's when you can get reactivation and infection in the, and it just manifests in the form of shingles, infections of the nervous, of the nerves and at, you know, aggravation. So the shingles vaccine is pretty much boosting the existing immunity that you have, getting you back over that threshold, that protective threshold. So as your vaccinated kids get older, will their immunity wane as well and not need a booster, or is the is the vaccine induced immunity longer lasting than the natural version? Ooh, that is a great question. Um, I hope those studies are being done. Um, I imagine it's known now, basically what that threshold is, and hopefully those maybe initial people are just in general surveillance is being done to understand. If I don't know if if children or the first vaccinees for this you know chickenpox vaccine, if they're ever coming out with chickenpox later in life because that Im that vaccine immunity waned, um, yeah, that's a good question. Will they need to be boosted? Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of like a lot of the science in what you did is in terms of that that uh, modeling of the, the was it cyan I can't remember what color it was mm -hmm. so, so can you just talk a little bit more about how you do that pro process because that seems to be absolutely key to what you did mm -hmm. um so I talked a little bit about x-ray crystallography um ooh. but um so we're making that protein in the lab. 
does that mean it is folded correctly like it is on the virus? Not necessarily, but what we do know is that the protein we make in the lab is recognized, is, can be bound by antibodies that recognize the virus. So if the, these antibodies recognize the virus, it must be making, identifying the same surface on the virus that it's the same surface of the protein that we're making in the lab. So that gives us confidence that the, the, the G protein that we're making in the lab looks the same as on the virus. Um, but then, yeah, we really, the experimental data that we collect from the X-ray diffraction pattern is in the blue. So what the modeling that we do is really modeled based on experimental data. So we're confident in those results. But no, did that answer your question? question about, okay. So you showed two different structures, like a very local structure. So how do you get, how do you generate those cyan patterns? Um, how, how do you decide that that's the structure that's the kind of bind it? Um, how do we decide that this is the structure it's binding? Yeah. I mean, because we observe it. We, we basically, based on our data, we have put every single atom into this structure um, using the data. So, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a mold and we fit in the atoms. And so we know this is exactly what that antibody looks like in gray. And that's what it interacts with, that's what the G protein looks like. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Uh, of the previous slide, so step three is you use the diffraction data to predict mm -hmm. the protein folding. Yeah. Is, is that software assisted? Is, I, I <laughs> deep learning that, that uh, there's new deep learning methods that can do that quite. Yes. Um, you're right. Okay, great. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, is there? Do we use software to go from these diffraction patterns to the electron density maps? Yes, there's software, but this is different from the big breakthrough in structural biology, which is predicting structures just from their sequence. Um, that's a program uh, called AlphaFold. It just has revolutionized our field. Um, in many great ways. Um, and so AlphaFold is really good at predicting some things and actually not so good at some other things. Um, and still, um, and so it's a great start if you do not have the experimental structure, but in the end, it's still just a prediction and having this experimentally determined structure is gives more confidence to the, the result of what something looks like. So does that software uh, allow like a human assist? Like, a, like, can you say, can it give you choice points at particular points and you say you think it's gonna go this way and so you can right. kind of interactively guide it? No, um, the only thing we choose is um, where, where to cut off the data, it's what's called resolution. It basically is how how tight and confident is this blue mesh map. And um, so the only thing we can say, it's based on statistics. How strong is that spot over the background, the intensity over the sigma? Like it's statistics like that where we say, okay, this data is not good. Let's not include it in our final model. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rebecca, you mentioned yeah. that uh, antibodies can be transmitted to the infant through the milk. Yes. Why isn't it digested in your digestive system? I'm very surprised a big thing <laughs> get across the cell membrane. Yes. So, um, so the antibodies that go across, so why don't the antibodies get digested? Um, when we drink cow's milk, our bodies digest the cow's antibodies. They turn, chop it up into little amino acids. Um, the antibodies that cross the placenta are coming from our blood serum. So they're coming from our blood and going into the infant's blood. So there's sort of a direct transmission there. However, once the infant is born, they are drinking mother's milk that has antibodies and they actually acquire antibodies because infants have these little receptors um, on the surface of cells in their intestinal tract called neonatal FC receptors. They grab the mother's antibody 
and bring it into their own bloodstream. So it's just really incredible. <laughs> so um, maybe two more questions. I can, I can stick around too. We can chit chat um, afterwards as well. <laughs> So I'm curious about um, the evolving um, resistance to uh, vaccines and what you can do about it. That seems to be one of the more striking things about going to the FMG combination. Can you say anything else about you know what you can do to uh, uh, work or to suppress uh, the um, uh, virus from evolving? Yes. Uh, so the yeah, the question is. Um, what are my thoughts about virus evolution and specifically evolving past vaccine-induced immunity? Um, as we know, it's a problem <laughs> even with coronavirus. Um, it's usually not just one or two mutations. It really takes several mutations to overcome that uh, diverse antibody response that we have to vaccines or infection. Um, what we know or what we hypothesize at least in, so one, the more diverse of an antibody response we can get, the harder it is gonna be for the virus to evade it. So having um, to overcome immunity to F antibodies, um, they only need to evolve against F, their F protein. They don't have to evolve their G protein. But we have, if we have antibodies against F and G, the virus would need to evolve both of those attacks from our antibody immune system. Um, what we know from some of the variants that have uh, come from coronavirus, um, what we what is believed is that they uh, came from an immune compromised person that was chronically infected. So they had an infection, perhaps generated a, a weak antibody response um, to the virus, but not enough to clear the virus. The, the immune compromised state allowed the virus to persist. And over time, within one host, the virus will mutate to resist the antibodies that are there. And you can end up with um, more diverse and mutated viruses. And so that has been observed in immune compromised people. I don't know if it can be said for sure that that's what happened for say Omicron, but um, that's one hypothesis. Um, and so I think one solution is to have more antiviral therapies for patients that are immune compromised to prevent that evolution from happening inside a patient. Um, I think also we, we might just have to do what we do for influenza, which is update the vaccines every year to play catch up. Um, and so with influenza, every year during our summer, it's winter in the Southern hemisphere. Those, those sequences, those viruses are sequenced and we adapt our vaccines to the sequences in the Southern hemisphere and vice versa. So we're always adapting our flu vaccines and we might just have to keep doing that as well. One more. Maybe this is a follow-up question for number one. That is to say, make protein form crystal. Is that <laughs> difficult? And can you do that for any protein? Is that quick and cheap, or is it a really big step in the process? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, how hard is it to make proteins form crystals? Um, they end up being more like jello crystals, not like a salt or sugar crystal. Um, so uh, what we have on our campus in the physical sciences building is a crystallization robot and it will test. We give the our protein sample and a bunch of different solutions and it'll combine them and see which mixtures promote crystallization. And so we can do about 400 different um, solutions in about an hour. So um, yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing. I will say in grad school, we didn't have those robots and I test, I pipetted everything by hand. <laughs> oh, sometimes we fail. Yes. Um, you might have heard something called cryo electron microscopy. This is a really powerful electron microscope. Um, I guess I did show you like the electron micrograph of um, the virus. So we could take much better pictures where we get uh, the detectors are much more advanced in the last few years, so you could get atomic detail of proteins like this. And so we we have a new instrument on our campus. I help co-write the grant for that, 
it's a almost $2 million piece of equipment and we just are starting to use that now. So if something doesn't crystallize, we usually throw it in the electron microscope and see if we can get images that way. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Um, and my offer is sincere if you're ever interested in visiting my lab, I'm happy to give you a tour. <laughs> That's great.